We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question is, what board game expansions do you consider to be must-have? Expansions you won't play a game without. So this question is often asked on different forums in one form or another. A couple versions in our question sets that we save up and we pull our questions from every week. Uh, it's been discussed on our Discord, I think, twice now, and it comes up every couple months on social media, and it seems to be a recurring Twitter topic where some pretty heated threads sometimes start rolling on about these. So what makes an expansion must have? What's our definition? Well, first off, this may be crazy basic, but what is an expansion? Is there a standard definition for what makes something an expansion versus anything else? I would think an expansion would be any piece of content created for a game after the original game's published. Um, while we're not going to get into tonight, I think this would even include fan-made expansions or fan-made content, um, or even player aids could be considered expansion content. I consider promos an expansion, as does Board Game Geek. If you sort by expansion, you get all the promos. Though I will admit, I can't think of any promos that are must-have for any games. Promos, to me, are usually more nights to have kind of cool. Um, but th to me, it still counts as an expansion. So uh, now, does the, that include for the, the, the shiny stuff? So the, the alchemists, or not the alchemists, the, the, um, uh, the, the cool improvement, improved tokens for... Uh, yeah. You know, and, and such like that. that I, I would definitely say yes. And well, if we read ahead to our list tonight, one of them pretty much falls in that category. So yeah, I would say resource upgrades if they, I, and to be honest, I just thought of an entire aspect of this that we're not going to delve into tonight because I didn't think of it till now. But with Red Meeple Ryan in the chat room, I think is very pertinent is that some upgraded resource expansions make games more accessible to players and make those expansions must have for people with the issues that require them. Fair it's something enough. I will admit we did not, I didn't think of to dive into, but is, is probably worth talking about a bit that some expansions do make games more accessible. And if a game makes a game more accessible for a player so they can play it when they couldn't, it's definitely a must have expansion for that person. So uh, I think I know the answer to this, but is there a point where it is no longer an expansion? Like what about these expand like, alone content where it's, you know, you'd stand alone or it can expand. Uh, a lot of the DC deck builder stuff could be considered yeah. expand alone. That, that one's rough. See, cause the same thing goes for like the entire trading card game format basically is built around this, right? Is there a must have magic the gathering expansion? I know there's been must have cards over the years. And when is it not just like a new version of a game? And when is it an expansion? Another example would be the Funkoverse games or something more board game related. They literally call their expansion, well, some of them expand alones, which means they can be used in expansion or combined with others. Um, another example of that would be the Disney Sorcerer's Arena. But for those, you still need the base game. So it's not quite the same as the Funkoverse where literally they're standalone. And another great example of that is Ravensburger's Villainous series all of their villainous series where the like a lot of people seem to think those three packs are are expansions but they're standalone games you can buy just one of those three packs and play villainous three players or you could buy two different three packs and have six players and never have to buy the base game right and i i don't know i don't know how to classify those yeah it's I really like don't. i know i i always recommend when we're talking about dc deck building teen titans is the go-to starter set you should get uh rather than the dc deck building starter set i feel teen titans is the is the better start starting experience right but they bo can both expand each other <laughs> now does the teen titans say expansion on it or does it just say D dc deck building teen titans uh i think it's like, all do part they of the consider DC it deck expansion? building uh I, that one i'm not sure i don't think I to, like an example the board game list the board game geek list actually right see what it's listed as because like for example smash up disney we reviewed a few weeks ago um might even be a month ago now sometimes i lose track of time uh, was very much a standalone product, but could be used in expansion. Right. And I wouldn't call that an, it must have expansion for Smash Up because it's not. It's a, it's a standalone game that also expands. Yeah, I, I will admit I didn't really dive into that for tonight's list. But I was also sitting here right now, I can't think of an expandalone that's must have. Right. So it doesn't look might like, be, it looks like all the small box stuff counts as expansions, but the big box, but the big box are standalone don't. games. Yeah. See, that's, that's what I thought for those, but I wasn't sure. Basically, sure. I, I think I, I almost want to say the expand aren't expansions. And I think for our definition, 
it has to require the base game. Like, I, I think when you get into must-have expansions, they have to be expansions that require the base game so that you can't play them on their own. They're not standalone. I think, for at least for this list tonight, that's definitely what I went with. Right. What's interesting, though, is something like uh, the DC deck building crossover packs, which are expansions. You cannot play the game without them, but those could expand any one of the DC deck yeah. building big box yeah. games. So, that's again, it's a, there's some interesting crossover. and, and There uh, is. Some, uh, uh, the other thing we're not going to get into is is our, our do do um do we like expansions in general? Um, well, we can say I like expansions, but I mean, I I, I don't want to. How valuable are expansions? Should you have expansions? Should games come with expansions? That to me is a whole other topic, other than must have expansions. Mm -hmm. At this point, we assume you're all for picking up board game expansions when they are necessary. So let's get into what we think makes a board game expansion necessary so so what i want to do is i want to take this almost to an extreme to like they have to improve the game obvious right like that's pretty obvious they have to make the game better in some way right but i want to go a step further and say i want to say there must have because i would not play the base game without them ever like if someone specifically was like i will only play the base game i'd be like oh can we please include this one expansion like but i only want to play it no no we got to play with the expansion like i'd actually argue it um you know me well enough i'll sit down and play anything so i i, I really i'm i'm saying i won't play the base game but i'm like i'd have to be coerced to play the base game without the expansion so to me i think that's one of the things or at least for the list i put together tonight these these are expansions that i won't play without and interestingly and importantly these are expansions that get taught to new players yes. so the first time you're sitting down and playing the game we're not going to leave this out for you and that's mm -hmm. something that that makes us re makes something really stand out because it's one thing if okay we're going to teach everyone the base game and then immediately throw in the expansion no 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 these stay in even for the teach yes yeah that's a, that that is my other big qualifier for this to list tonight is would i pull the expansion to teach the game to someone new or would i keep it in there so that is definitely an exp a part of that. Now, the other one is if I forget there's an expansion, like if it's so seamless that it's just now part of the game, which is also going to include games that have kind of adopted their expansions with later editions. Fair enough. Well, let's start off with the other end of the scale. Uh, since we've broken this list into those two sections, uh, we'll start off with games that still to this day have standalone expansions that we think are must to have starting with. So the first thing that came to mind when looking at doing this topic, and we've been, we've been talking about this topic for a few weeks now, so we've had time to think about this, but the first game that came to mind was Terraforming Mars and the Prelude expansion specifically. Terraforming Mars is one of my favorite games. It's one of my most played games. Um, up until the COVID-19 pandemic, I was playing Terraforming Mars almost on a weekly basis. We were playing that game a lot. The thing with Terraforming Mars, though, is it's long. It is like a five-hour-plus game at times. And you start off so slow. You don't have any resource generation. And until you get cards in play, you can't do a lot. Well, one of the big things Preludes does is gives you some kind of engine at the beginning, some little push that gives you a bit of starting resources and starting way to start generating and building that engine. It's an engine building. So that is a fantastic thing. The other thing, though, I find is, especially at the start of the game, you are sitting with a hand of 10 cards. And depending on how often you played the game, as long as you played a few times, you're looking at those and you're trying to figure out what the heck to do with them, knowing the vagaries of the giant random deck and what's going to come up. So you're like, man, what do I do with these? Well, Prelude gives you some direction. So not only do you have your corporations to choose from and go, okay, there's one that's based on steel and there's one that's based on, on space cards. Well, you get your Prelude cards and go, oh, wait, I can combine that steel one with this one that's going to get me to place a mine as my first action on the game. So that gives me an engine right from the beginning. So it gives you direction. Go, okay, I'm obviously going to make a game based on paying for things with steel. And there you have a way to go. And actually, I find this great for new players. Because if you haven't played it, that handful of cards, you're like, what do I do with these? I have no idea. You're like, okay, try to find a synergy between those Prelude cards and your Corp and go with that. And that really helps new players to not be overwhelmed at the start of the game. 
I remember my first experience with terraforming Mars before Prelude, uh, and it's daunting. It is not, and you, you really have no idea, and you feel from that start like you're just going to get crushed by the people around you who are familiar with the game because they're looking at their cards and, and they're shuffling them, and you're rearranging them. You can see them the working out these strategies and which way they're going to go for the game and, and how they're going to build their engine. And realistically, you don't have any idea. And Prelude just makes that a whole different ball game. Yep. Uh, if, if you think of it like driving, you know, you're driving uh, normally on Terraforming Mars, it's a whole straight road before you get into that, you know, that downhill where you can build up, build up momentum and get your engine going. Uh, and it really takes off a lot of that, that flat road at the start of the game. Yep. And that was Terraforming Mars Prelude. All right, the second one on my list is Core Worlds Galactic Orders, the first expansion for Core Worlds, which I think came with as much stuff as the base game. Now, this one I found frustrating. This was the first game I'd ever played that did this as far as I could tell and was obvious about it, was blatant about it. Now, I love Core Worlds, and I still consider it one of my favorite deck builders of all time. But when the original game came out, it was incomplete. The instructions stated as much. You had your cards and there were symbols and the kind of in the middle of the card where your set symbol for magic cards would be. And, and that obviously were different card types and it didn't explain what they were, even though and, and the rules just said, oh, no, ignore this. It's for a future expansion. And I was like, what? Well, if there's a future expansion, give me the future expansion. Like, don't don't make me go buy another product for a complete game. Now, I will admit the game was fine without it. It worked. But every time I played, it felt like something was missing because, well, it was. There was an aspect of the game they cut out. And every time I taught this game to someone, they'd be like, what are these symbols for? And I'd be like, a future expansion. They're like, what? What do you mean a future expansion? I, I, this was a game where they cut out a part to release later. Now, Stronghold Games has explained, and Stephen Bonacore has explained, this wasn't malicious. This wasn't a money grab. This was done to keep the cost of the core game down and more reasonable, because back then, no one was going to spend the $80 it would have cost to put both together. So I kind of get it, but I will admit it was frustrating. Yeah, that's that's rough. I mean, when you're putting that in there, when you're, when you're, when you're, you're, you're telling people it's in there, um, it, it doesn't matter whether there's a good reason or not you're yeah. still dangling this this hook in front sure. of them and and not giving them anything which is mm -hmm. essentially going to make them need either need to buy the next product or hate you and not buy your products at yeah. all anymore um, uh, there was a lot of debate on board game geek when this expansion came up absolutely I, it's uh it's a dangerous tool and i mean is it really necessary do you have to have those symbols on there you know if you aren't going to release it don't release anything about it in the original base set so this was a symbol that was literally on every card. Every card fell into a classification, which was explained with Galactic Order. Now, I will say, Galactic Orders came out, I got my copy, and it was everything I hoped for and more. It really did complete the game. It also did some cool stuff like providing a bigger box, so everything would fit in one place. So I still think it's really weird that my box says Galactic Orders and not Core Worlds, because it wasn't like a Core Worlds. Sure. Like, you use the expansion box, which was kind of weird. It even had room for future expansions, which thankfully weren't needed to play. The new faction mechanics were cool. They added a lot more player agency over the game and they reduced randomness. It was great. Due to all this, Galactic Orders to me is a must-have expansion. Like, Bornicor is right. It's meant to go with the base game. I will never play Core Worlds without it. And if I teach the game, I don't even bother mentioning it's an expansion. I'm just like, and this board goes out and these symbols, when you play a card, you put a token, spend a token to do a thing. And no one would know which ships come from which expansion, right? I won't play it without. And unless people start talking about buying it, like I'm teaching, I'm like, man, this is really good. How do I get it? I'm like, okay, I'm sorry to say this, but this is actually two boxes in one. You want to pick up this and this. So that's the only time I'll actually bring it up. Now, interestingly, they did put out another expansion. Actually, there's even a solo one. Like, they're still putting content out for this game. This one's still going. But the next expansion, Revolution, I don't feel this one's must-own at all. This is one I will actually remove from my set when teaching the game. So it's the opposite of our destiny definition of a must-have expansion. To me, it's neat. It adds a new thing. You get leaders and asymmetric abilities. You know, I love asymmetric abilities. So, yes, all the power to them. But it's just overly complicated for new players. So Galactic someone, Orders, yes. Revolution, no. 
And as someone who uh, taught, learned uh, core rules from Mo, I had no idea that it was an expansion I was learning. Yes, that's a good example, actually, because, yeah, <laughs> when Sean showed up, I was just like, whenever you play a card with these symbols, you you get a, you go up on this track. Well, it's not a track. It's a pile of tokens. I'm not here to teach you. <laughs> but that was Core World's Galactic Orders. All right, next up is one that our chat room has already mentioned once, and that is Zaya Embers of a Forsaken Star. This one, I think, is, is I don't know, it's funny. It, it amuses me, and it's interesting, because I love Zaya. I, I played multiple games of Zaya and and had no problem with it. I'm like, this game's highly random. Yes, I can I level up for rolling a 20. I get victory points, and I can jump into a sun. Um, this, th this expansion fixed things I didn't know were problems until I started playing. Yes, I played a game of Zaya where one player took advantage of a short supply run with two planets that were next to each other. And they jumped back and forth a bunch at the beginning of the game and upgraded their ships quicker than everyone else. And they had a huge advantage and they were runaway leader. And yes, they won. But that was all just part of the game to me. It didn't bother me. And then every time I tried to play a space pirate and I'm like, you know how I'm going to do it to this game? I'm going to go for bounties and I'm going to shoot people. And it never really worked out that well. And sure, some of the missions got a little repetitive. But again, it was Zaya to me is an experienced game. It's an epic, silly game where you don't know what's going to happen. You're out in space. Who knows? It wasn't until I played with Embers that I realized just how broken some of these things really were in the base game. This is the perfect example of one where I will never go back from. And if someone asked me to play Zaya, they're like, hey, come play Zaya. I'll be like, do you have Embers? I'll be like, no. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll bring my copy next week and we can play it because I have no interest in playing it without the balancing factors that this expansion added. Now, in addition to things already mentioned, you also get a new damage type where your ship can get covered in ice, a new home base everyone can use. So everyone has a central location to go back to to repair. Lots of new ship upgrades, solo plays for those who are into that. Neat little comets that circle around planets. Lots of new things. I, this, to me, I, I feel this expansion is so necessary to make Zaya great. And it was already good. That I they need to far off games if they ever reprint Zaya if they go for whatever they're on fifth or sixth printing it needs to have this just put in the box. Yeah, absolutely. Now I didn't play Zaya before Embers when I for my first introduction to Zaya was with Embers of Forsaken Star. I think possibly the first time you played it. Uh, I think it was might have yeah, been, it might have been. I'm not sure if it might have been the first time you you got it out. Um, and and it was just a fantastic game. Like this is the, this is a great game. Uh, and then hearing about some of the earlier play, um, I think a lot of the enjoyment you may have had of that game are, are a little bit rose-colored glasses uh, because, again, it's you didn't know any better, but yeah. there, there's just th that randomness. And, you know, you wanted to love this spacefaring game that's got all this cool stuff, but it's also got all this nasty randomness and mm -hmm. just literally broken mechanics yeah, like, that you were willing to overlook mechanics. at the time. Yeah. Um, until until you found out that, oh, wow, this is a really great game when yep. we just tweak a few little things. And and those tweaks were Ember, was Zaya, Embers of a Forsaken Star. And in all fairness, if you're a heavy Euro gamer, you may still hate it. It's not like it made it a perfect information economic <laughs> game now. No, it's definitely Stick not to a your Euro. Twilight Imperiums. All right, next one, another sci-fi game, and that is Race for the Galaxy and its first expansion, Gathering Storm. I love Race for the Galaxy. It is one of my all-time most played games. According to BG Stats, it still is my most played game, even though there's a couple others that are creeping in on it. I have played over 100 games of Race for the Galaxy. Now, I played the original quite a bit. I liked the original. I had fun with it. I showed it off to friends. Found out it's a great two-player game, which actually shocked me. But it was Gathering Storm that made me fall in love with it. All right. As I was saying, I played Race for the Galaxy a lot. Um, and I liked it. But Gathering Storm was what made me love it. That's when I fell in love. This is an expansion that feels like it completes the game. Now, for all I know, it's the same as Core Worlds above, like the, that we just talked about. Like the, the expansion is meant to be part of the base game, but they split it off for some reason. And it does feel that way. This expansion offers better card balance. Um, the most important part is more cards with keywords, which are needed by some of like the seven cost developments where like you get a power if you have more uplift cards. Well, this added more of those uplift cards and the alien cards and the other keywords. Um, better seven cost developments, 
gold tiles. Gold tiles and race are huge for the same reason that we mentioned for Prelude for Terraforming Mars of giving you direction. You start off a game of Race for the Galaxy for a handful of cards with tons of icons on them. You're like, I don't know what to do. Now you can be like, well, at least I'm going to go for that goal or I'm going to try to do these two things. That was extremely useful. Then full rules for solo play. It has the most... I don't know how to describe it. It complicated is not the right word, but involved AI system I've ever seen using flowchart style boards and rolling funky dice to figure out what the AI does every turn. I liked race. I love race with Gathering Storm. Now, since Gathering Storm, there were a bunch of expansions that came out out of this, but this is the only one I feel that was must have. Now, one thing I learned eventually is that these expansions were released in trilogies. So the first trilogy was Gathering Storms, Rebels vs. Imperium, and Brink of War. And honestly, those are the only expansions I recommend people pick up at all. Anything, anything more than that makes the game feel bloated. And I think some people even think Brink of War started to make it feel a little bloated. And I, I don't disagree. Well, they may, they, they never put out like a buy race with the expansion included. What they have done now, though, is they did bundle those first three expansions. They actually also bundled the second three expansions and the designer now has stated, just pick one of the two boxes to use. So that's kind of interesting that they realized it got bloated by itself. And I got to say your best way to pick it up now would be to pick up that whole trilogy that includes Gathering Storm instead of buying Gathering Storm and Race. I would buy that trilogy and the original game. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, as fantastic as Race for the Galaxy is, they did sort of drift towards Ascension in the, mm. we have way too many cards, you are never going to be able to shuffle this deck ever. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, and and, oh, you know, and like extra player boards and stuff. Like you never played the ones where there was like an alien base where you have to move meeples on in addition to the war track that keeps track of your thing. And then your ability to flip other people's planets over. Like it, it just got, the icons were bad enough. And then they threw in all these little optional rules. Yeah, I mean, anytime you need to split the deck up among multiple people at the table in order to shuffle the, the, <laughs> the main deck, that's a bad sign. That's just, it's a bad sign. But that was Race for the Galaxy Gathering Storm. All right, my next one, our fifth one on the list is the Power Up expansion for King of Tokyo. Now, if you're looking for a super simple, kid-friendly, dice-rolling Yahtzee King of the Hill game, King of Tokyo is fine. It's a bit, to me, I'd, I'd rather play it than Yahtzee. Yes, you get some nice little power cubes. You get to buy some cards to make it kind of neat. But you'll never see me or even my kids playing with just the original. It's just too basic, too random. And what I hate the most is it doesn't matter which of the cool looking monsters you are. This game needs the power up expansion, which makes it asymmetrical. But like, yes, I know I love asymmetrical, but this one, it just matters, right? Like, it should matter if I pick the Cyber Bunny or if I pick the Godzilla knockoff uh, Gigazor. Like, that should make a difference. With the expansion, now it matters. Every single monster has its own unique deck of cards, which makes them all feel different. And they actually have different play styles. Different ones are meant to be played different ways, and that is just really cool. Now, what I will recommend is definitely pick a power up, but start with one power each and play. Don't wait for someone to roll three health to put one in play. You want that asymmetry right from the beginning. Now, speaking of health, um, hearts, health, whatever you want to call it, the other thing I like is that the fact that this expansion gives you a reason if you roll three hearts, which in the main game, if you're full health, you're like, oh, I rolled a bunch of hearts. Well, now if you roll two hearts, you're like, oh, wait, I might get to level up. So I do like that little bit, too, which does add a fun decision point and a bit of a push your luck element. I was shocked when they put out a second edition of King of Tokyo, which I will admit, I have not tried the new edition of King of Tokyo, but I, I was shocked that Power Up was still a separate expansion, like very shocked. I'm like, come on, like, why, why didn't you just put it in there? It's like, like the expansion box is this big. It's, it's one deck of cards. Yeah, OK, there's a couple tiles and tokens, but it's like it doesn't seem like something where they would have had to pull the expansion out to keep the price point low. Yeah, and it's interesting because. I mean, it's really easy. King of Tokyo is a really, really easy and basic game. Mm -hmm. um, staggeringly so. And, and that one expansion, uh, Power Up, takes it from being a really basic, silly game that's kind of mindless and pointless to an actual hobby game. Uh, I think this, you know, and if, if you are interested in the hobby game aspect, don't pick up King of Tokyo unless you're picking up Power Up yeah. because it's not a hobby game without it. Frankly. Yeah. 
Technically, there is a big box now, which I think does include it in all the different variant monsters and promos and pandas and turtles and whatever the heck came out for that game. But that was specifically Power Up for King of Tokyo. All right, next one is Orleans Trade and Intrigue. And Sean probably agree with me on this one. This one's similar to Zaya because I didn't know what I was missing until I had it. And I really didn't know because people told, kept telling me and I'm like, nah, I don't need that. I don't need that. I don't need that. The game's fine. I love Orleans. It's one of the best games in my collection. I can't remember where it fell on my top 25 list, but I think it was still in the top five. I would have called this an almost perfect game until we played with Trade and Intrigue. Now, the funky bit here, though, is that it's only one part of Trade and Intrigue that I feel is a must-have. One part of it is essential, and that is the Improved Beneficial Deeds Board. And I think the designer knew it because by calling it Improved Beneficial <laughs> Deeds Board, just how much of an impact this had. I will never play Orleans again without that board, even if teaching the game with new players. To the fact that I don't have the original board in my box. I took it out and put it on my shelf with, like, spare cubes and stuff I've upgraded so that I don't accidentally use the wrong one because it might go, you know, a year since I played and I'm like, oh, which board's the good one? No, I only have the one in the box. I, 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 I am going to use this all the time. Now, most of the other modules were may or may not use, as you can read in our review. Like the orders adds pick up and deliver, which I thought was neat, but the end it didn't like. The new palette play styles, okay, sure, toss those in. Why not, right? The new play styles, more choices. That's cool. The new events are kind of cool. Uh, like I did like them. They were a little bit more balanced but that beneficial deeds I need in every game. Then there's the intrigue board. We didn't enjoy that one at all. I just leave that in the box. It's technically still there because I bring my game out to public play events and someone might want to play with that. I didn't personally feel the need for one part of it. So you have an expansion here that I still recommend fully, pay full price for, buy it just for one piece of it. And maybe you'll enjoy the rest. And what I would say is that while it's not for us we did not enjoy the intrigue there are game groups out there that would consider intrigue a must-have mm. uh, we know some game groups that would consider that a must-have if your game group likes take that are the really aggressive uh, com competitive players then you're going to want intrigue in that game because that adds that whole aspect to the game which is otherwise completely missing Yes. Um, and so if you want if you want that kind of a game, you don't get it with the game with the Orient until you add in the mm -hmm. intrigue. So I it, it really it's you know, there's a part of it that's an absolute must for everyone, but there are certain game groups that would consider the intrigue a must have portion of that expansion as well. So weirdly you can't use both, which I think is one of my main complaints about it is you use the intrigue board or you use the new beneficial deeds board. You could use both. I might have liked it more. Well, that is trade and intrigue for Orleans. All right. Next one is the rise of Titans for Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria. Now, if you back Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria on Kickstarter, you don't have to worry about this. They did throw it in, which is kind of cool. But similar to trade and intrigue, this is another modular expansion where there are parts we liked more than others. So that's why I wanted to follow up Orleans with this. For now, for this one, there are two modules which we'll be using every game going forward. One is take it or leave it. We'll probably use it most games because I don't see why not. And then one we'll probably leave in the box. But I still wouldn't mind using it. It's not intrigue level for me. It's, it's, it's okay. I'll use it maybe. If someone else asked for it, sure. Now, I'm not going to dive in deep into this one because we're going to be reviewing this one later in the show. So what I would say is check out our Rise of Titans review. Uh, stick around if you're here live or check out the segment on YouTube or the review on the blog for more details on this one. Right. And that is uh, Rise, of Titan. Rise of the Titans for Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria. Oh, Rise of Titans. Rise Despite of what Tori and Kat want. They <laughs> want it to be Rise of the Titans. I'm like, right. sorry, it's Rise of Titans. Like, there needs to be a the. The Rise of Titans. Rise of the Titans. Yeah, I agree. They, they don't be a like the name somewhere. Yep, there should be. A, it's just Rise of Titans. Actually, technically, it's Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria colon Rise of Titans, I think, is the, the official name of that game. I don't know. Check check up top later when we review sure, it. It's, it's right here. here the, see? <laughs> Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria, Rise of Titans. <laughs> All right, next up, 
Um, Sean's going to disagree on me, with me on this one. This is the extermination expansion for the 3X board game Horizons uh, because it should be a 4X board game, and Deanna and I both feel that you shouldn't release a 4X game without all 4Xs. Now, in addition to adding a 4th X, this also adds a much-needed level of player interaction that felt missing from Horizons before that. It was very much multiplayer solitaire with a little bit of a Oh, I got there before you. Ha ha ha. Now I get it. The player interaction in this expansion is mostly negative player interaction. You are doing mean things to other players and damaging them in some ways. So I get that it's not going to be for everyone, but I felt it had its place here. Now I'll admit, I also feel the same way about Twilight Imperium 4th edition, which lasts the exploration. How do you call it Twilight Imperium and call it a 4E when it only has three? But that they first expansion also put it out, and I can't really talk to it because I didn't try it with the expansion. But I just, like, if you're going to put out a 4X game, put all 4Xs in. Now, to compromise, because I know it's not for every group, what I would have liked, especially because it's like a small box cheap expansion. It's like one of those, like, like why didn't you just put it in there? It's like, I, I can't remember how many new cards it is, but it's not a lot. Um, I just, you should have had this in the main, main box and just had a variant to use it. That way you got the core game. And if you want more, take that. You want your intrigue in your horizons. You can throw those extra cards in. I just want all my X's in one box. Yeah, no. And this is, this is a fair argument. Uh, again, I did not enjoy that op that module as much, but it does make sense to have it in the game. Uh, the fact of the matter is I don't necessarily love four X games uh, for the, for that fourth X, but there's a reason they exist, and there's a reason there is a term, a 4X game, and releasing a 3X game is kind of odd. <laughs> yeah. So I, I am amused they at least called it extermination. Like, uh, you know, if you're going to add an X, I'm, I, the Twilight Imperium 4 is the first expansion, should be called Exploration, though I know it adds other stuff. And that was Extermination for Horizons. Well, that's it for our must-have standalone expansions. Let's move on to three games with expansions that have been added to the base game in later printings. Honorable, mention, honorable mentions for our list, if you will. Yeah, these ones I originally had mixed in, and then I realized they kind of stand out because I don't even know if you can get the expansion separately anymore. But I did want to call these out in case you do have a copy of the base game, or if you have the base game, never picked up the expansion and don't realize what you're missing out on. So I wanted to point out that these games have been completed and you may want to check out the new versions where you get everything integrated. So the first one, and someone in the chat room has already called this one out for us, it is Kingsburg. Uh, the expansion was called To Forge a Realm. This is, to me, the best example and the first I thought of when thinking about games where the publisher went, whoa, this should have been in there, and then reprinted the game without telling anyone like there's not like includes on the box like no one said anything just ever since the second printing of kingsbird the dice driven worker placement game the contents of forge of realm expansion are just in there they're in the book they're just they're not even separated out as stuff you can use or not use it's just there the game rules include forge the realm forge of realm just as if they were always there which i think is great because kingsbird was just kind of okay until you had monsters to fight like that it needed that extra step of it, I'm not just building up my city and my forces and who has the best castle. Now I'm building up my city and my forces and seeing how we do against the hordes that made the game. Yeah, I, I know I haven't actually tried Kingsbird. So this one, this one I can't comment on, but that was Forge a Realm, which is now included in Kingsburg since the second edition. Yeah, and if you played it, you see it with Forge a Realm because it's not like you can get them separate anymore. All right, next up, a game that kind of got mentioned earlier, and that is Eclipse. Um, Rise of the Ancients is the specific ex expansion that I feel completes this game. To me, this is a must-have expansion that now you get as part of the base game because everything from Eclipse Rise of the Ancients has been added to Eclipse Second Dawn for the Galaxy, uh, a rather large box that you can't quite see because it's behind Diana's chair. Sorry about that. Um, this expansion introduced so many different things. So rare technology. So you get that rare pull from the technology bag where anyone can buy it and does something neat, including like new ship parts and specialized ships. It added new developments. 
It added more tokens that you flip over while you were exploring. It added rules for alliances. That is something that I'm like, how did you put out a 4X game without the rules for alliances? Well, I guess alliance isn't an X. But to me, an alliance forming is a big part of those games. And yes, people used to do it. We're like, I'm going to make a deal. We want to attack you. Well, now there was a way to me mechanize that. Um, the ancient home worlds, which was just so much neater, where you, when you get to the, the, the bases, the, the enemies have defenses now. Four new factions to play, including the ability to play nine players. A nine-player 4X game, that's massive. When I first got this, I knew I was never taking it out of my box. And then when I sold my copy, I sold it with it, even though Ancients actually eventually went uh, out of print. And people were like, can I just get Rise of the Ancients off you? I'm like, no, these go together. Sorry, the, these, I couldn't even take them apart at this point. They're, they're so integrated with one another. So that, I, I, again, Sean's played, but you played it after all this was tossed in. So... <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, and Ryan's pointing out there that Eclipse had a lot of expansions for what was already a 4X board game. Yeah, there was quite a few, and a lot of it was modular. This was the first big box. They called it the first big box expansion for Eclipse, which is why I felt this one was necessary. There were some other interesting ones, like for one, the ship miniatures, a uh, uh, cool nice to have, which is going to be ironic based on our last item to talk about tonight. Um, the, the cool ship minis were kind of cool, but that one I even added in a variant rule for player order that I now use every game. But it wasn't necessary. I just prefer it that way. I know many groups that prefer to go clockwise no matter what, because they're going to do it anyway. And so that, to me, is not a must-have expansion. I don't even remember which one that was in. And then there was a later one about, like, Xenobiology or something. Yeah, Eclipse had a lot of expansions. But of all of them, and I did own all of them at one point, and now own them all again based on what was uh, integrated with the Second Dawn, um, the, you needed Rise of the Ancients. And again, that was Eclipse rise of the ancients okay my last one's a bit silly and i've kind of hinted at it a couple times here but i refuse to play anachrony with at least one part of an expansion which was the exosuit commander pack and that is the plastic mechs the plastic exosuit minis that you slide your little wooden worker tokens in i i can't see ever playing anachrony by stacking cardboard tokens and like putting them down and things sliding that would just oh it would bother me so much it wouldn't feel right. It'd be like, you know, have, having processing disorders and, and things being in the wrong order and needing to fix them. It would just be wrong. Um, if anyone asked me to play Anachrony without them, I'd be like, I'm going to drive home and get my minis, okay, because this is wrong. Now, with the original expansion, when it was first published, uh, it actually also gave you two different big expansions. One, the Guardian of the Council, which is another whole set of miniatures that weren't in the base game, a whole new faction that could be used as a, like, third party faction and was also used in the solo play or you could now use them as a new like choice at the beginning and then the pioneers of new earth modules which added your ability to level up your mecha so there were two things that fit the exosuits i keep calling them mecha but the exosuits so those were pretty cool uh, but i mustn't be the only one who loved the minis because they were included with the base game in the latest kickstarter which included the infinity box and two new expansions and when mine showed up, I got all that with it. Now, interestingly, just before recording, I was on their website. The game now, they pulled them out. So here's an example of, for the Kickstarter and for the Infinity Box, they put the miniatures in, like, yeah, it's must-have. Everyone's got to have these. I'm like, nah, let's pull it out. And again, I'm, I'm guessing it's mine class trying to keep the cost of what's now called the Anachrony Essentials Box, which is the main box you want to buy now. And the Exosuit Miniature Kit, or Miniature Pack. It's called a Miniature Pack. But that Miniature Pack, unlike the original Exosuit Commander Pack, just has minis. There's no expansion content in it. You just get miniatures. That's it. Um, what they've done with the expansions is they've thrown them in something called the Anachrony Classic Expansion Pack. And I love you Minecraft games, but like I don't even know what to tell people to buy anymore. <laughs> so thankfully, your website was pretty clear if you were totally new on it, but it like, you have to almost like uh, unlearn what you've learned if you go there about anachrony and like just read the page to find out what to buy. So this was a unique one and and because it, it, it didn't include it, put out an expansion. Everyone loved it. So like, here, we're going to give it to you. And then like, no, no, wait, we're going to take it out again. Because <laughs> maybe, maybe there was like they put it out and people weren't buying it at the higher price point. I don't know. But this one's silly. Like it's it's plastic miniatures to put cardboard tokens in. But the game's so much better with it. It just feels wrong without it. And that was the Exosuit Commander Pack for Anachrony. 
Now that's it for our list of must have board game expansions. Are there any we missed? What's a game you have that you won't play without one or more expansions? Tell us about it in the comments. Now we're about to check in with the lobby, but a bit before that, just a re quick reminder that we are here to answer your gaming and game night questions. You can get questions to us by going to tabletopbellhop.com, clicking on Ask the Bellhop. You can fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or message me directly on social media where I can be found everywhere as tabletopbellhop, one word.